Welcome to Conversations with the CEO. I'm the Director of Communications, Ann Peterson, and we're joined today by CEO Tim O'Keefe. Thanks for joining us, Tim. Morning, Ann. So I know our original plan with today was to kind of look back at 2021, but before we do that, let's look at where we are right now in 2022. So on Friday, uh, January the 7th, the board made the decision to shut down indoor facilities until January 31st. Can you talk a little bit about what was behind the board's decision in doing that? Yeah, so, you know, I think most everybody probably has, has heard about the rapid expansion of infections due to the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. And um, I would say on last Monday, which, what was that? That would have been January 3rd. So following the New Year's holiday, when I came in that day, I, um, I was concerned, you know, the Thursday before, Friday was a holiday, uh, the Thursday before, um, that the numbers over the first, you know, the mid two weeks of the month since about mid-December for infections had, had increased pretty significantly. And there was a lot of, you know, obviously at the time, a lot of talk about why that was happening. And uh, so on, on the third, when I came into work, and I pulled up the data from the county over the weekend and looked at the state data. Uh, it was really, really concerning just over the weekend how dramatically the numbers had increased. So we talked amongst the staff here, I think a couple of times, uh, myself, the HR manager, and um, <clears throat> Jeff Matheson and Paul Donner, who have the lar- both have the largest employee basis here. Um, and we were also experiencing some employees getting infected. And the interesting dynamic here is that most of the infections were coming to people who were already vaccinated and in some cases already boosted. And so when I went back to look at the county's data, they have recently begun to include uh, infections in and, and a category for boosted, vaccinated, and unvaccinated. So there's now three categories. So took a look at all of that. And by Wednesday of last week, became real concerned. So I reached out to the county's public health director and um, we got reacquainted. We hadn't had much communication since last summer and um, asked him, you know, given what's going on, what they're seeing at the county, whether we should be doing anything different here in Rossmore. And that's not unlike conversations that I've had with the County Health Department for the last two years, but I was reaching out directly to the public health director specifically, and he got back to me very quickly, and he he said, uh, this thing is moving very quickly, um, even though we're not issuing a health order at this time to close facilities, um, I would strongly recommend that you shut down all indoor activities in Rossmore due to the age demographics of your community. So that was on Wednesday night. So I got that message from the director on Thursday morning. Had had several other back and forths with, with him throughout the day on Thursday. And um, so by the end of the day, we had, I contacted the board president and we agreed to set up a, a, an emergency meeting of the board for Friday afternoon, uh, which was January 7th. And so I provided the board with data that was as of Thursday, because they hadn't updated yet for Friday's data. So I gave the board the information from the county on Thursday, and the board met for um, just about two hours and and deliberated, um, you know, do we close? Do we scale things back? Are there other steps we can take? Um, what really is the risk? Um, so I, I thought what I would do is take a moment here to share with the residents the data, the updated data as of yesterday, which would be Sunday, January 9th. They haven't yet updated the data for today, January 10th um, on the county's website. So I'm gonna share my screen here so you can see the data that the board looked at. Uh, and, and although it is, it's been updated since the board saw it and it's worse. So when the board saw it, it was dramatic. It was actually frightening. Um, and, and then it's obviously over the weekend got even worse. So um, just give me a moment here and I will share my screen. Okay, so uh, here's my screen. This is the data directly from the Contra Costa County Health Services website. 
you can see at the top of the screen, this is, I, I just refreshed the screen a moment ago. So they haven't yet updated the data for today. So this is as of yesterday, Sunday, January 9th at 1130. So you can see the total cases here in the county, 129,000 active cases is just under 20,000. I can tell you that a week ago, that number was 12,000. So you can see just in in a week's time, it's it's gone up significantly by about 50%. So that's, that's the case data. So then I shared with the board this information. So this is from the beginning of the pandemic, as I put my cursor over here at the beginning. So this is March 1. Uh, the very first case occurred right around the beginning of March of 2020. So you can see as, as we've progressed, the first wave occurred in the summer of 2020. Then you can see the next wave here peaked at Christmas time or right around the uh, first week or so of January of 2021. And you can see the case data there. Then you can see it dropped off significantly through the spring. And then no surprise when the state opened everything up on June 15th, then shortly thereafter you saw another big spike and you see it hitting a peak here, 442 cases on August 12th. That's the seven day rolling average. But then you scroll here to where we are right now and you can see, whoops, you can see these um, these numbers here at the at the top. It's it's grayed out because they are still collecting data. So anything that's gray to the right of the screen here, they haven't yet tabulated all the information from all the sources where they gather the data from. So the blue, you can see this number hasn't even plateaued. It is still very very high. Uh, seven day average as of January second, fourteen hundred but you can see the data that they are currently rolling with as of January 6th is at, at uh, around 18, roughly 1800. So, um, and then they, this is a seven day average. So this thing just keeps rolling. So no plateauing yet. And so uh, again, the numbers that we showed the, the uh, board of directors on Friday were slightly better than this lower in other words, but they are more than double the peak that we saw back in uh, January of 2021. So that was the first data set that the board took a look at. The next thing I'm going to show you, I'm going to scroll here, is this is case rates by vaccination status. Let me just scroll it a little bit further. So um, again, this now this schedule only goes back to April of 2021. Um, you can see the dark green, the top line, are the infections of unvaccinated people you can see the peak here in August of 2021. The green line, the light green line, that's reflecting the infections of fully vaccinated people. And at that point in August of 2021, they still hadn't yet released the booster. That didn't become available until October. So you can see uh, on the bottom here, the dark green, or I, I guess it's a dark blue line. It's fully vaccinated and boosted. So again, this schedule is the case rates by vaccination status. So this is positive COVID infections by vaccination status. So the highest being those that are unvaccinated still is very, very high. It's if you're boosted, you're in a much better place. Um, you're three times more likely to be infected if you are unvaccinated than if you have the booster. But you can see that it also is spiking for people that are boosted and for people who are vaccinated. So um, those numbers are going up. In fact, the vaccinated rate is approaching the rate for the unvaccinated. So like I had mentioned at the outset, uh, one of the things that we became concerned about in the first week of January is that we'd had a handful of employees that had um, uh, tested positive and yet they were all vaccinated. So that, that's the concern. And then the, obviously the general population data is reflecting something kind of similar. So that's um, the first piece of information that I shared, or second piece of information I shared with the board. The next I'm gonna share with you is the status, the, vac or the uh, infection rate by age demographic. So you can see here that the worst demographic for cases in Contra Costa County this is 3,612 infections per 100,000 residents is in the 19 to 30 age group. And then you can see children under the age of 19. These are the groups here, the three bars here at the top. And then you see each of the 
uh, I guess you call them the decennial groups, following uh, 31 to 40, 41 to 50, 51 to 60. And then you get pretty much to the profile of Rossmore, which is 61 to 70, 70 to 80, 80 to 90, and over 90. So the infections are heavily skewed towards the younger age demographics under the age of 50. That's all of this area, these one, two, three, uh, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six bars under the age of 60, which is where most of the infections are occurring. Um, so very, very high. And, uh, and the reason I'm sharing this with you is we're going to look at the death data in, in a moment. Uh, not next. I've got a couple more I'm going to show you. So the next I'm going to show, let's see, not that one, hospitalization data. So this is a 60-day uh, window. So this goes back to the early November. So this is a, this is a seven day average of patients in the hospital. Uh, uh, green is hospitalized, um, not in the ICU, and blue is hospitalized in the ICU. And uh, then the yellow little bar tick, uh, trickling here at the top is the seven day average. So as you watch this in November, um, not too bad. And then you start to see it change right before Christmas. So here on December 21st, you start to watch this go up, 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 and up, and up, and up. And here we are as of January 8th. So that would be Saturday. So the numbers are uh, in hospitalizations are going up significantly. Now, it's not a huge number. Here's the data for the whole county. 172 are in the hospital and all the hospital systems in Contra Costa with COVID and 22 are in ICU. But, but this number two weeks ago was uh, I think around 45. So it's, it's gone up dramatically in, in the last uh, two weeks or so. So it's getting concerning. So um, let's see the next one I want to show this one not, is not quite as relevant other than just being interesting. This is the rate of new COVID hospital admissions for people ages 18 and older. So the top one, again, unvaccinated, the green fully vaccinated without a booster, and then the blue are the boosted population. And you can see all three of those increasing pretty dramatically in the last, uh, say, three weeks or so. Um, testing data. Now here's death data. So since this has begun, there's been almost 1,100 people in Contra Costa that have died. 91% who have died were unvaccinated. So uh, clearly, if you are vaccinated, it's giving significant protection against dying from the disease. But um, what I'm going to show you in a moment here, let's see, deaths by gender. So interestingly, Women who are infected at a higher rate than men, but men die more than women, although these numbers are very, very low. This, let's see, nine people in the last 60 days have been female, 12 have been male, unvaccinated. Both of these categories in green are unvaccinated. But you can see here for men that four deaths in the last 60 days have occurred to people who were vaccinated. Uh, out of the 16 deaths that, uh, in men that have occurred, um, women, what was that? That was nine women have passed away, all unvaccinated in the last 60 days. But this is why uh, the other schedule I think, think was relevant. You remember that the infections were primarily in this category right here, ages five to 50 was the, was the biggest numbers. But you can see there's been no deaths by anybody under the age of 30 in the last 60 days. And then you start to see these numbers increase. But dramatically, it is people of our age demographic here in Rossmore that are dying from this disease. So you can see these numbers here. So virtually all of the deaths, um, three deaths have occurred to people in the last 60 days under the age of 50. All the other deaths have been over the age of 50. And, and that's Rossmore. So um, that's what we shared with the board. And I'm going to stop sharing the screen here. So that's what we shared with the board. Although again, the data that we shared with them on Friday was Thursday's data, which was not as bad as this information. Still, there's no plateauing here at all on any of the data that I've just shown you. So nothing is leveling out yet. Uh, I was listening to a, a news report on the way into work this morning. 
and uh, they were discussing that some epidemiologists were, were suggesting that this might be four to eight weeks before we start to see see this thing tail off. What they saw in South Africa, which is where the Omicron virus was, they think, uh, mutated, um, it fell off in about that window, four to eight weeks. So, uh, and also in the UK, they've seen apparently similar um, information. And uh, the UK's data has often uh, predicted what was going to happen in the US. So it's it's interesting. Uh, who knows whether it's how it'll all play out. But this is what the board was deliberating on uh, on Friday, and then given what the county public health director had recommended um, on Wednesday and Thursday about us shutting our indoor activities down, that's ultimately what may, uh, led the board to their decision, and it was a unanimous decision. So um, I, I applaud the board for making that decision. It was very tough. Uh, it's I know that this is upsetting. I, I've, I've been bombarded here this morning and over the weekend with emails from residents who are upset about the closure of the pools in particular, the Tice pools. Uh, and even though there is a roof that opens, the county has already determined that that is an indoor facility. And so they are not, um, they're not willing to classify it as an outdoor facility. So, and the board specifically discussed whether we should treat the Tice pool, given that this is the board's decision, not the county's decision, whether the Tice indoor pool should be uh, left open or not. And they decided that, nope, it's since the county is classifying it as an indoor facility, we should close that pool as well. So we are going to open the dollar pool uh, a week from today on the 17th. Uh, it takes that long to get the pool uh, cleaned and reheated because um, it, it's kept at a pretty high temperature. I think it's around 90 or 92 degrees. So it's it's very warm. We don't expect there to be a lot of use there in that pool. Uh, but I know that there are people who, who will take advantage of it, um, and we will not be instituting a reservation system. We don't think at this time of year when it's so cold out that they'll, it'll be that heavily used like it would be when the weather is a little bit warmer. So the difficult decisions. I know this is upsetting for people who have made plans, and clubs that have who, who've, um, had events or gatherings scheduled, and for private uh, gatherings, whether they were memorials or weddings or whatever people have reserved GRF uh, facilities for. But the board um, felt that this was the prudent thing to do to keep people safe. Um, the risk is significant and um, and it is our age demographics that are, are the ones at risk. So just to clarify, Tim, you talked about the fact that ICUs are at 22 and that um, we haven't actually talked about this yet, but we do know based on the zip code that the vaccination rate is very high here in Rossmore. So if you can just kind of reiterate one more time what it was the board was looking at, why they felt it was that it was necessary in here for our residents to shut it down for about three weeks. Well, and it's just because of the risk to the age group. Um, again, that last slide that I, or screen that I sh uh, shared on the death data by age demographic, it's pretty telling. The, the infections are significant to the younger age groups, but they're not dying from, from this disease. It is the older population that's dying. You saw in the earlier slide that infections in our age group here are very low. It's the lowest demographic. You look at from 60 to 100 years old, the infection rates are a fraction of what they are at, at the younger age demographics from 50 and below. So all the infections are pretty primarily, and not all, but the major, the vast majority of infections are occurring to younger age demographics, younger than, than Rossmore. But the deaths that are occurring are at our age demographic. And what, what the board didn't want to be uh, responsible for was having an event here, um, whether it's a, a speaker or a concert or a bus excursion or whatever it might be, and, and it being end up being a mass spreader event mm -hmm. and having a whole bunch of people get sick and people dying. Um, it, it just, it, it's preventable. So I know this is in, an inconvenience. The board recognizes that. I know that was in, in, in uh, D uh, President uh, Dwight Walker's message over the weekend in the Nixle announcement and press release. Um, but just, and, you know, the board is 
hopeful that people will understand that they're trying to protect the community. And uh, again, the county health director, a public health director recommending to us to shut down our indoor activities was was a, a driver. And then this data that I've just shared was the other key factor. These, these are exactly what the board was considering. And then the staff data, I'd like to talk about that for a moment. Yeah. So that we do have some staff who are unvaccinated. We have talked about this previously, the board's decision not to mandate vaccinations. Um, and so I, I feel like we've gotten to continue to get a lot of criticism about that. I want to make it clear once again what the board decided a few months back, why they did not mandate vaccinations for the staff or mandate it for the residents. Um, the government operates under a different body of law. So the state of California has the government code and then you have the civil code. So the civil code is what we all operate under or the corporation's code. So we as a corporate entity operate under the corporation's code. All of us in civil society operate under the civil code, but governments operate under the government code. And governments can mandate, or I should say state and local governments have the legal authority to mandate whatever they want with their employees. But unless this, the state or local government are going to mandate vaccinations, um, employers do not have legal, um, uh, an exemption from legal liability if they were to, if an employer was to unilaterally mandate vaccinations and, an and then terminate employees who are unvaccinated that will inevitably lead to lawsuits. And if the government is not yet willing by, by a state law to exempt private employers from liability for making that determination, most private employers are not willing to take that risk. Our attorney had advised the board that unless you are prepared to spend about $2 million to defend a case all the way to the United States Supreme Court he, he did not recommend it. He just said that it's, you, you, you know, if, unless you got to spare $2 million, don't do it. Now you have seen some of the largest corporations in the United States do that, but you're talking about Microsoft and Salesforce and these trillion dollar companies that they can afford to do that. The Golden Rain Foundation only has monies that come out of the payments that residents make. So the board did not feel it had had a spare $2 million dollars of resident monies, that that would be even a good use of monies to use to defend a lawsuit or multiple lawsuits all the way to the Supreme Court, because ultimately that's where it's going to get decided. That that there will be these large corporations will be sued for by employees who have been terminated because of their uh, failure failure to be vaccinated. So, but in a sense, Tim, what we have done mirrors mandates that you know places like mcdonald's and american express big ones have done meaning that employees have to prove they're vaccinated and if they aren't then they have to test weekly can you talk a little bit about that that testing program so that residents understand if you're unvaccinated there is still a requirement for you to continue to you know continue working here right so all unvaccinated staff every week have to have to be tested they have to have a negative test and show it before they can come to work on Monday. Uh, they provide that information to our HR department. And so they, the HR department monitors that. If you don't are either are not able to get your test or you weren't able to get a test or you tested positive, you are not able to come to work. So um, we do have a small number of employees. We The staff vaccination rate, full vaccination rate is at more than 91%. Um, so we have a higher vaccination rate than the residents who live in the 94595 zip code. The zip code in, uh, vaccination rate is 90 or is uh, 88 mm percent. -hmm. So um, so the staff are in a better place than the residents uh, in terms of vaccination status. But if you do the math, if there's 12 percent of the residents in our zip code who are unvaccinated, uh, that potentially means that there's about 1,200 to 1,500 residents who are unvaccinated. Um, now, probably uh, the vaccination rate in the zip code in, 
in, it, our, I should say our zip code includes, I think about 7,000 people who live outside of Rossmore. So to the north of us over by the Rossmore Shopping Center, those homes in that area are all part of the zip code as well. So um, probably their vaccination status is less than Rossmore is what I would guess. But it's probably a fair guess to say that it's about 10% or so of the Rossmore community that's unvaccinated for whatever those reasons are, whether they are health reasons or religious reasons or out of fear or whatever it might be. Um, we don't know why the residents here might be unvaccinated. But so the board's looking at that information as well. They were concerned that if the zip code is 88 percent and we could have, you know, 12 to 1500 people in Rossmore potentially unvaccinated, that there is a there's a, a huge risk to them those those charts that I showed earlier, so we want to the board wanted to to address that. So staff are uh, vaccinated at a higher rate than the zip code. Staff we take a lot of precautions to keep the residents and the staff here safe. Um, we all wear a mask in our in the buildings. I'm at my desk behind a closed door. If you're in behind a closed door, you're uh, um, under the health order. You're allowed to remove your mask. Um, so I'm in my office with the door closed, so I don't have a mask. But anytime any of us gets up out of our desk, we are required to wear a mask to the building. And I've, I don't, I don't, in two years, I don't think I've ever seen anybody, I don't think I've seen anybody's face, <laughs> to be honest, <laughs> in person. It's, uh, it's just a weird environment that we're in, but uh, we it need is, to get but, through the end know, of the month. On the topic of vaccines, though, I mean, we, we do have to point out the fact that Rossmore was really at the forefront of that from the get-go. This kind of gets us to looking back at 2021. So let's go back and look. We go all the way back to February of last year, and that was when the vaccine clinics started coming in here. And we started to see that first glimmer of hope, if you will, that things might turn around. So can you talk about sort of where, where things were from then to now in terms of how we've made that sort of the focus on, on getting folks vaccinated and reopen. Yeah, you know, so you know those, those slides that I showed earlier, you, you saw the case rate going all the way back to the beginning of the, of the pandemic in March of 2020. And um, you know, I remember looking at those charts back then and they looked very dramatic as we got to that first surge. But now when you look at retroactively at, at that same chart, it's, it's so much worse right now in terms of the number of infections. I mean, it's, it's, I mean if the peak was in the summer of 2021 mm -hmm. and we are now more than double right now, the infection rate, it's um, with no end in sight. Although, as I said, the epidemiologists feel that this is going to probably wind down in the next four to eight weeks. At least it'll calm down. And, and, and then what's going to happen with the coronavirus at that point? Who knows? You know, if you look at the 1918 um, pandemic, um, it took about two and a half years and they had no vaccines and, a, and it went away. And they feel that today the common cold or the, I should say the flu, some varieties of the flu that, that circulate, they think are derivatives of that 1918 pandemic so that may maybe that's where COVID goes maybe it becomes you know something no less lethal than than the flu um but you know the flu people die from every year the 30 000, i think americans die from the flu every year so it's not that it won't be lethal hopefully it will get to a point where we have even greater vaccinations greater protections um, and maybe antibodies, but over the weekend, I've also learned uh, I, I, I heard, I, uh, from people that I know that I talked to over the weekend, we're now seeing people that have gotten COVID and have now gotten it a second time. And um, so it's just like, okay, when is this thing ever going to end? <laughs> so going back to looking at 2021, so as the, we, we were able to get uh, to two clinics here, uh, Kaiser and John Muir both operated some vaccination clinics in early uh, 2021. And uh, that was a huge boost and benefit here for the community. And then concurrently, the, the state opened up a vaccination clinic right outside our gate. And, and that was continuous. While John Muir and Kaiser were only here, I think a couple of days each, um, the clinic that was operated at the Tice Valley gym right outside the gate, that 
I know a lot of residents took advantage of that and got vaccinated there. So I think there was a lot of optimism uh, by the community, by everybody, not just here in Rossmore, but everywhere, everywhere. There was optimism that finally the vaccines are here and that, you know, life could get begin to resume back to some semblance of normalcy. But unfortunately, that's not how it's played out. It did through the spring. Then June 15th came. The governor, not just here in California, but all around the country and the world, they started opening things up right there in June of, of last year. And then we saw the next, the highest spike, which occurred in by August of, of this past summer. So, um, and then it, and then it tailed off and everything was looking pretty good until about December 14th, December 15th, it had stayed relatively flat. And then the Omicron virus was announced, I think in South Africa in early December. And within 10 days, it was here in the United States. And I, I saw some data, I think on Friday, that I think it makes up 93% of all the infections in the US right now. Delta variant apparently is more lethal. Um, Omicron and our public health director confirmed that Omicron appears to be less lethal. Um, the symptoms appear to be less severe especially if you're vaccinated and especially more if you're boosted. So, um, but as we saw, saw in those charts, even if you're boosted there, you're, you're getting, you can still be susceptible to getting the infection. So um, yeah, I, it's uh, becoming a more common thing. I, I mean, I think it's going to be more and more people that we know are going to be getting it. I'm, you know, keep knocking on wood and hoping that I'm not going to get it and, and you and, um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a difficult time for everybody right now. And I, and I know people's patience is, is all of this is trying everybody's patience and tolerance. That said, though, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this too. I find it amazing just how adaptable our residents have become, whether it be moving meetings to zoom or, you know, finding creative ways to, to hold events outside, what have you kind of seen from where you're sitting with how the residents have sort of responded to this constantly changing world of COVID that we're living in? <laughs> well, where I see, I've got four walls. I don't see anybody. So um, it's, it's just that part of it's really sad. So I, I'm thankful that we have zoom because at least that, that is the only way that I'm, I'm having any really social interaction with anyone is through zoom, which also doesn't feel great, you know, but <laughs> it's better than not. And it, and I think it's better than telephone. Mm -hmm. um because at least you it, i think you can have that personal connection a little bit more than you can over the phone so but yeah i i would agree that by and large our residents have adapted i think early on in 2020 it was it was scary people were upset many people were angry that things got closed because we closed things down 11 days before the state did and there was um you know a lot of people upset about that but we you know, the health director has subsequently told me that we likely saved lives when we did that. And um, so that for that, I'm I'm grateful. I, and I hope that the community recognizes that um, the decisions that that we have made over these two years have been to protect the community, recognizing the unique vulnerability that we have, because 100 percent of the people who live here are at the highest risk of getting the disease and dying from the disease. You know, there is the, the, the thinking that many people have that, hey, look, I'm an adult. I can make my own decisions for myself. I can decide whether to go to the movies. I can decide whether to go shopping. I can decide whether to socialize, whether to get to go to a club meeting or a, a concert or whatever. I'm, you know, if I'm willing to take the risk, who are you to tell me that I can't? And so I get that. I, I, Definitely, I hear that. I um, and there are, you know, are times. Honestly, I buck that uh, in my thinking. I don't actually do it because I'm immunocompromised. I, I have, I'm a cancer survivor, and I don't have the lymph glands that m most people have. So I, if I get it, it's it may not be good. So I'm have to be extra careful, and my family has to be extra careful around me. So. Um, I know I'm sharing personal health information, but <laughs> it, I, I want people to understand that I'm sensitive to it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sensitive to those that feel that, hey, that it, I'm 
you know, I'm entitled to my freedom and my freedom to make my own decisions. But, but the difference here is that the Golden Rain Foundation is a private enterprise. It's, it, it owns these facilities that we have these events in. And the Golden Rain Foundation, the board is not willing to take on the liability um, to, to create an environment that could potentially put people at risk that could end up suing GRF from not making the right decision. So it's one of these things that they're probably damned if they do and damned if they don't. But I think by and large, most people, uh, the majority of people, I think, are understanding and, su and generally supportive. But like I say, everybody's impatient to get this thing over with. And But, you know, it will be over once we can get this virus to go away. It will go right. away when it doesn't have a place to propagate. And for those that are unvaccinated in our, in our lives, all we can do to encourage them to get vaccinated will help. So if you know friends or family members, contractors, whoever we're engaging with that, are your, that, that you are engaging with, that you know are unvaccinated, do what you can to encourage them to get vaccinated because that's how this is going to end. It's not going to, as long as that thing can keep finding unvaccinated and even now with Omicron vaccinated people and to infect them, it's going to keep mutating and keep, you know, hopefully it mutates itself out of existence, but we don't know that yet. So we've spent a lot of time Tim, talking about COVID. Let's shift gears here, um, give the residents a chance to hear about what else is going on in Rossmore. Um, for starters, I, one of our positive pieces of news is that the studio renovations are nearing the end of phase one. Can you talk a little bit about where things stand with that? Sure. So just as a refresher, so the, the Gateway Studios are, we've got uh, the ceramic studio, the sewing studio, art studio, lapidary, wood shop. Um, those are what we call the gateway studios. And so the board uh, decided a couple years ago to renovate those studios. There was a promise made more than 20 years ago when Peacock Hall was built that the next major project that Golden Rain Foundation would do would be to renovate the studios. And that was more than 20 years ago. So the studio members and clubs haven't forgotten that commitment and they've continually reminded the boards that, uh, that since I've been here that, hey, you made this commitment, where, when is that gonna happen? So a, a couple of years back, the board agreed to do that, but it's, a, it's an expensive deal. And, and part of the reason for the renovation is that those, those rooms were originally meeting spaces, like what we have multi, the multi-purpose rooms for, or like what we have, Hill, the Hillside Clubhouse for. So way back, back in the 60s and 70s, that's what that facility was used for. They were meeting spaces. And then over time, as, as Rossmark continued to develop, um, they became studios, dedicated studios. And, but because of that, because of that's original use, they have a lot of windows. They had a lot of doors on both sides of the building, on the back side, the front side, and I'm not even sure which side is the front or the back, but you've got multiple doors to each studio uh, on opposite sides of the rooms, and which is fine. We, you need to be able to exit in case of an emergency, um, but they don't need so many, and they don't need so many windows. Um, the clubs wanted more storage space. They wanted more functionality of the space, and when you're, when you're creating space for doorways, and doors to open, um, you lose a whole bunch of, you know, potentially usable space, floor space. So um, they needed better lighting, they needed new ceilings, they needed new electric, uh, electrical, all of that needed to be upgraded. So uh, the board authorized spending a about $800,000 on the first phase, which is for the ceramic studio and the sewing studio. Um, so <laughs> That, this project has gone on, it seems, forever, because at the time that the work got started, the pandemic had, had started, and, and then you've heard about the global supply chain disruption. And, you know, what is supply chain? Well, that's suppliers and manufacturers have what's called just-in-time manufacturing. So when they go and build something, or, or Home Depot wants to stock its shelves, they only wait to order when they, their supplies are low. They don't have any extra inventory. And so when you do this on a massive scale, on a national or an international scale, and all of a sudden there's a disruption to, to what's called the just-in-time manufacturing and inventory model, all of a sudden 
you don't have the things you don't have the doorknob you don't have the light switches you don't have the light bulbs all these things that because factories in china and vietnam and places that what they've done m much of the manufacturing global manufacturing occurs all got shut down because of COVID. the plants were shut down so now you don't have home depot and and all the you know home building supplies et cetera. Et cetera. So, and that is exactly why this project has taken many, many more months. We have been waiting on windows. The windows finally arrived. They were on a ship forever um, because all the ports have got, you know, if you, if you drive across San Francisco Bay right now, I, I drove across last weekend. Uh, there were like, I think we counted 32 ships out in the harbor or out in the bay, uh, all waiting to offload these big, huge container ships just anchored out there and just, um, south of the Bay Bridge, they they can't offload, and you multiply that by a lot in Los Angeles, where they have I think something like a hundred ships sitting out there, or even more. It's uh, which is the biggest port in, in the country. Um, all these things coming from the Far East, all these manufactured products, toys for Christmas, and clothing, and I mean, all of our clothes are manufactured in in, in the East. So uh, all that got tied up. So we've had a very, very long delay getting the studios ready, but they are very close. Um, not exactly sure. We're, we're kind of crossing our fingers and hoping that they'll be open by the end of this month. But uh, <laughs> we're still waiting on some more parts. <laughs> yeah, Great. We're still waiting on more parts. But the, the important thing is the windows are finally in and that we needed that and the lighting is all in. And so there's just some remaining like door handles and things like that. So we're very close. And the board has indicated that a second phase, looking at Lapidary, the wood shop, um, is definitely one of their priorities. And they did that as part of the facilities master plan. For residents who don't know what that is, can you talk a little bit about what the facilities master plan is and where we expect to go with that, where the board expects to go with that? So the whole idea behind the facility master plan is that when Rossmar was built and developed starting in 1964, the developer had a master plan. They had an idea for what, how they wanted to build out Rossmar. And believe it or not, they originally planned more than 11,000 units in, in this valley. Um, obviously, it never got built that high. We've got it 60, about a little less than 6,700 units is where it's, it finished out. So it didn't build as many homes as they had originally planned. But the clubhouses, ori the original clubhouse was the gateway facility. And then over the years, you know, then the dollar house was was converted. It was, I think, a sales office at one point for housing, and then it got converted and and became a, has become a clubhouse. Creekside, there used to be a uh, Stanley uh, Dollar Junior mm -hmm. had his home at where the Creekside complex is, and that ended up it was a dilapidated home, I'm told, and it was torn down, and then the Creekside complex was built there. So, since the original development. There has been no master plan for the community. So when, uh, you know, now we're at the end of the life cycle of some of these buildings. Hillside Clubhouse, you know, is, is coming up on 60 years old. Uh, Gateway, although Gateway had, was renovated 20 years ago, but still, that was 20 years ago. We're already a generation beyond the renovation date for, for Gateway. It's not needing a renovation at this stage, but, um, but Hillside certainly needs attention. MOD needs attention. MOD is it really needs attention. I mean, it's it's um, that, that's uh, that's a problem because that's the lifeblood of the whole maintenance operation here, and we, we so that's something that this board or future boards are going to have to address is what are we going to do about the MOD building? So, what what we needed was a a guide um, influenced by the residents as to what should be done in for the future what is it that residents want what are the shiny new you know playthings, you know buildings amenities games you know pickleball for example and we'll talk about that in a few minutes mm -hmm. but pickleball was something that didn't exist you know in rossmore 10 years ago um it, it didn't even exist much in the united states 10 years ago but it has absolutely exploded so how do you plan for things like pickleball or new games or sports that are invented and that, that, that are especially attractive to this age group. So things evolve. Uh, where the Gateway um, Peacock Hall, the theater is, that used to be shuffleboard courts. And the reason it was called Peacock Hall was because there were actually peacocks and that's where they roosted, was right there at the shuffleboard courts. So that's what they named the theater after the peacocks that used to be here. 
residents ended up getting upset at the peacocks because they're noisy, I, I guess. I've never <laughs> lived next to a peacock, but at least not a furry kind. But um, I, uh, the residents actually wanted them away to go away. So I, I'm not sure how they disappeared, but a couple of decades ago, the peacocks went away and then the peacock hall was built in honor of, of the birds. <laughs> so um, things change. And so what, what will Rossmore look like five or 10 or 20 years from now? And, and that's the value that the master plan, I think, gives to the community and the current and future boards, at least for the next few, you know, handful of years. We'll have an idea as to perhaps what could be done with Hillside. What else could be done at Gateway to make it more functional? What could be done at MOD? What could be done? When should um, you know tennis courts be resurfaced? When should the golf cart bridges, which are in dire need of replacement, when should that get done? That's a very expensive proposition to do that because it involves five or six different regulatory agencies, anything that touches the creek, we have to go through a completely different regulatory process than we do with a building permit for a building, for example. So all of these things are being considered in the master plan. And, uh, and the board will, will uh, I think by the end of this month, we're, we're going to see the final draft of that. So the communities had a number of workshops and forums for residents to provide input. There's been a number of presentations to the planning committee. Many residents have participated in those. Um, planning committee has you know, provided some insight. The board, they've made presentations to the board, but it will be the final draft will be coming back to the board here soon. So you can look forward to that here soon. Going back to Pickleball. So you have this challenge in Rossmore with the fact that everything is so built out. How do you then address what didn't exist 10 years ago? How do you find it a home? So Talk about how pickleball has sort of evolved this year in its mm. quest to find courts. <laughs> My goodness, this is uh, <laughs> uh, this has proven to be a, a big challenge. So pickleball is a popular sport. Uh, I, th I think there's around 550 members in the club. Mm -hmm. um, they have two indoor courts at the fitness center that are not dedicated, although they get the bulk of the playing time. Court time is for pickleball there. And when the fitness center was renovated, there were three prior to the renovation in the gym, um, but that was reduced to two. But at the same time, we expanded and, and, and created three outdoor courts at the old Creekside tennis courts. Now, the Creekside tennis courts are in not in great shape. The, there's been a lot of erosion from the creek. It's caused a lot of cracking on the courts. So what the board had authorized, I think, about a year ago was a, re a renovation of the Creekside courts. But then what happened is when the engineer went out there to do soil testing, they discovered that the erosion and, and movements next to the creek um, required some additional subsurface support that, that more than doubled the cost. And so the board kind of took a step back and put a pause on that project and thought, well, maybe we ought to explore other other locations and and therein lies the rub um, pickleball or any other activity that is wanting to either develop or grow in Rossmore requires somebody else giving up something to to for that activity so uh, no matter where it's been whether it's the 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 grassy lawn area to the east of the Dollar Clubhouse, um, which many people, especially during the pandemic, have taken advantage of to, as, a, as a gathering spot. So it's outdoors and, and they enjoy kind of the solitude and the quiet and the, and the beauty of that location. They didn't want that disrupted by the noisiness of, of pickleball. Um, on the other hand, it was it's the best location in terms of the distance away from homes. And so that, that was attractive to, and for that reason, that's why it was explored initially uh, as a possible location for pickleball was because it was hundreds of feet away from the, from the nearest home. So the, the chance that homeowners would be impacted by the noise would be greatly diminished. So, um, but as, as you, we all know, that didn't go over very well with the community. And, and so that was taken off the table. So, uh, so dollar grounds are safe. No pickleball will, will be there. 
Um, so then that required the board to take a look at other flat areas in Rossmore. Now we don't have any undeveloped flat areas. Um, residents, some residents have said, well, why don't you use the parking lots at Gateway? Well, uh, obviously they might be residents who haven't been lived here since the pandemic began. Prior to the pandemic, it was not uncommon not to have an, a single open parking space at the Gateway parking lot. And as you know, Anne, at, at Creekside, where your office is, Creekside is often full, um, although during the pandemic, not as much because the clubhouse isn't being used as often. But uh, pre-pandemic, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've driven around the Creekside parking lot looking for a parking space and had to go park either on the street or over at the event center parking lot for a meeting over at Creekside. It, um, so parking here is problematic. So the board decided to take a look at Buckeye, the tennis courts, um, seems like two, two, you know, racket slash paddle uh, sports seem like they might be compatible. And in fact, across the country, that is what typically happens is tennis courts get um, reassigned to pickleball. You can put up to four pickleball courts on a single tennis court. So board explored that. The board has looked at the lawn bowling. The reason lawn bowling was interesting was because obviously it's flat. It's undeveloped. Um, other than the lawn bowling greens, but the lawn bowling club uh, numerous times over the years have requested to have artificial um, surface instead of grass. Uh, the last request was a couple years ago and they requested it and then they, a, a month or so later then they retracted it. They decided, I guess maybe with a change in leadership, they decided they wanted to keep the grass. So, th so that's been on a back burner, but um, since the club has expressed interest in this multiple times over the years, it seemed logical, like there's a big flat area, maybe it could fit there. But it's, you know, relatively close to homes. Lawn bowling and pickleball are really incompatible sports. Um, pickleball is loud and noisy. Uh, lawn bowling is not. It's quiet and serene and requires concentration and so on. So, um so we don't have a lot of good options. And, you know, it's a zero sum game for us to create a new amenity in Rossmore requires us to take something away from somebody else who doesn't want to give it up. The other option that the, that, that we have become, a, um, I guess, semi interested in is outside of Rossmore at the Tice Valley park, which is behind the fire station behind the Tice Valley gym. So um, there's a soccer field there. There's a beautiful walking area. It's all studded by trees. There's, there's homes are a distance away. Um, there's an unused softball diamond there. And, and there, behind the softball diamond, there's kind of an unused, it, it's a, like a half circle. But uh, interestingly, you can actually fit eight pickleball courts on the combination of the unused area behind the softball diamond and the softball diamond. So we approached the city and asked whether they had, because we knew it was underutilized and after some conversations with their recreation director for the city, and they acknowledged that it was underutilized and that they would be interested in perhaps having conversations about that. Um, so they wouldn't give us, you know, exclusive use of courts there, but they would be willing to consider uh, if we provided the financing um, or the funding um, they would consider giving us some some dedicated time, and and honestly, our residents are really primarily interested in playing in the mornings. That that seems to be when the bulk of the pickleball time, especially during the spring, summer, and fall when it's hot, um, there isn't a lot of play that occurs on the courts in the afternoons. So, so the city was willing to have a conversation around that. Um, that might be a great solution because literally there probably would be nobody objecting except for other residents in Walnut Creek, especially there's a pickleball club over, uh, I think off of Lavorna or somewhere that um, uh, with, has, has their eyes set on that as well. And they, they'd like to take advantage of that space also, but they don't have the financing to, to pay for that. So, so we'll see. I, I, I don't there's been no decision made on this. We're exploring all those options. And we're also taking another look at Creekside. Instead of putting seven courts at that location, which is what was doubling the cost, we think we might be able to put, um, I think, four courts there, string them out differently, lay them out differently, um, 
and then resurface the area. And so to create, at least for a few years, a better surface than we currently have with an expansion of by one court at that location. So that's going to be another option that we're currently investigating. And I'm not sure um, the, the planning committee was interested in it, and um, but I'm not sure you know exactly how all this stuff is going to play out. We're exploring multiple options at Pickleball at the moment, and uh, stay tuned to the planning committee meetings for further updates, and, and we'll continue to let the planning committee know what the results are of, of the other um, studies that we're doing at the other locations. Great. So a project that uh, is progressing a little bit faster, but is definitely more of a long-term project, water reclamation. Why do you think water reclamation is an important project here in Rossmore? And where do you think this is headed? Well, I'm going to tell you a funny story. <laughs> a resident who, uh, who regularly uh, talks to me about things and issues and of concern that they see and observe in the community contacted me last week and wanted to meet with me. So we, and he didn't want to meet in, over Zoom, didn't want to meet on the telephone. Uh, he wanted to meet in person. So we went into the, into the gateway boardroom. We were fully masked. We were about eight or 10 feet apart. And, and uh, we, had a, we had a meeting and he wanted to, he wouldn't tell me ahead of time what it was about. And what, it, what I learned is it was about water reclamation. And, and what he said, <laughs> what he said to me was, Tim, spending you know millions of dollars on a water reclamation facility just seems like it's just too expensive and he's he said some residents have mentioned to him that uh they think that this is the tim o'keefe taj mahal that he wants the tim o'keefe the ceo <laughs> wants this water reclamation facility to be built to place his stamp on rossmore <laughs> and i i can tell you i can think of a whole lot of other things i would put my stamp on other than a sewage treatment facility um but uh so i have no interest whatsoever in any project here i have no vested interest in it. i'm not a property owner here i do the bidding of the board and we explore things that we think might make sense that residents are providing input and feedback on let the board know about these ideas and, and in the case of water reclamation, this is not about a Tim O'Keefe ego thing. I, I, was act, I wasn't sure if I should be insulted or flattered that anybody <laughs> thinks that I have an ego. I, I, I guess I probably, everybody has an ego on some level, but I, 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 I don't think I do. And I certainly don't have any interest in-, in I've sat saying, in enough meetings to know this is definitely a board priority. <laughs> yeah, it, water reclamation now, so let me move on then. So th just to make that clear, this is mm -hmm. not, but I can tell you why I think it's important. It is not for the golfers. And that's what I think everybody automatically gravitates to. They think that water reclamation is so that the golfers can have a green golf course. And, and you know, people have pointed out, well, only 20% of the residents here play golf, and, and which is probably true. 20, 25% is probably the number somewhere around that which is probably true. But, you know, for any amenity we have here, we don't have 100% participation in anything. In fact, golf is one of the highest, in fact, it's the second highest participation after the fitness center. Um, but it, water reclamation, sure, it would be a benefit to have year-round green grass during a drought uh, to play golf on. Um, but that is not the primary reason. The primary reason is for the safety of this community. We all saw what happened, I think it was in 27, 2018, when Paradise, California, burned to the ground. And Paradise is different than Rossmore. It was in a forest. Um, but we have wooded, you know, grasslands around us as well. But, and we, we're in a bowl. And so there is some concern about the fact that we only have one public uh, entrance and exit into Rossmore. We have multiple exits or entrances if we needed to um, and uh, several that are paved but uh, we don't have access to them the city does the police department the fire department they can open them up if we needed to in an emergency and we can talk about that in a later session no, we're not, we won't go into detail about that here today but water reclamation uh, what we learned in the drought that ended in in uh, july of 2017 was that had the drought continued into 2017, we were already at a mandatory 40% water reduction on the golf course by the state. 
all golf courses in California, but golf courses, parks, and cemeteries had a 40% mandatory water reduction. Had the drought continued through the summer of 2017, they would have moved that to 60%. And had it moved, had the drought continued to the end of the year of 2017, they likely would have moved it to 80%. At those levels, we would have first had to discontinue watering the tea boxes, which are the most, or I'm sorry, we would have first discontinued watering the fairways. Um, and then the next stage would have been to discontinue watering the tea boxes. Mm -hmm. The last stage, the most expensive part of the golf course to maintain is the greens. That's the place where the hole is that you, where you hit the ball. Very expensive to maintain. It's a special kind of grass, takes a special kind of mower, takes a special kind of equipment to, in fertilization and all of that. A lot of care goes into the greens. And <clears throat> so consequently, if the golf course dies, uh, Rossmore would have a brown space throughout the heart of the valley, running the length of the valley, three miles long. And um, I will tell you that brown grass uh, burns. Green grass does not. Green irrigated grass that's regularly irrigated, uh, the soil is moist, will keep that grass green as long. and fire will not burn green grass. It will singe it, but it will not burn it. So if you had a fire, a wildfire sweeping through one side of the valley from either the east side or the west side, it will, it will stop. And, and it's likely that's the direction the fire would move. You know, in the summer months, we have the, the breezes that come off the ocean, off, off the bay, and, and they blow to the east. And then in the, in the fall, we have the opposite occur, the warmer air from, from the east, from Nevada, from the desert, the flat areas of California, moves across towards the west. And um, so likely that's going to be the direction that fire is going to move. So that golf course is the fire break for the valley not only that it would be the initial evacuation zone it would be the initial triage for the emergency personnel they would be bringing all their equipment and staging it on the golf course but if there is uh, brown grass that's on fire obviously we can't initially evacuate to there we can't initially stage equipment there so it would be a it would be a problem so that is why water reclamation is so important, is keeping that grass green. And we are actually um, scheduling meetings with our elected officials, the, our state assembly member, state senator, county supervisor, and con local congressman. Uh, in the next uh, 30 to 60 days, we have a number of these meetings already scheduled, just to impress upon them how critical this is and whether or not we can find any financing that would finance a private water reclamation facility like this. Um, there are funds available for public entities to do water reclamation. So governments, um, water districts, uh, sewer districts, and so on, they can find grants, federal and state grants to do that, but private businesses cannot. So, um, so that's why we're, we're going to go through this series of meetings with the public officials to uh, see whether they can help make either legislation or funding available to private organizations like us to do this for, for a safety reason. But, but absent that, it, the push is, or at least the interest on the part of the board is that we continue to explore th this to see whether it's viable. And, um, you know, you don't want paradise to happen here, Paradise, California. You, you, we want to, at worst case, lose half the valley in the event of a massive, uncontrolled wildfire. Hopefully that never happens. And I'll segue just for a moment, is that we, we've placed a lot of um, resources and time and attention to um, uh, wildfire and evacuation planning. Um, so, so you know, the, the fire breaks, creating the fire breaks in the open spaces, uh, making, ensuring that we are meeting all, uh, meeting or exceeding all of the fire department's re requirements around, um, you know, uh, distance around the homes and the type of vegetation around homes. So uh, I know that Rebecca Pollan is, is actively trying to encourage mutuals to remove landscaping that is highly 
uh, susceptible to fire and with some success, uh, but mutuals don't have money to burn either. <laughs> Literally. Um, <laughs> they, you know, they've got to be careful about how they dedicate resources to uh, very expensive to remove trees and that are, you know, like eucalyptus trees and things like that. But some, but there are mutuals who are budgeting for it and steadily uh, making progress on that end. So Anyway, and that's why water reclamation on, is important. You touched on evacuation planning as well. Can you talk a little bit about kind of what we've done so far? I, I know Tom Cashin put out the, the cards about the emergency evacuation zones and also where we're headed. Um, I understand this spring we may actually have a little bit more on the evacuation front ahead of us. So we've made, uh, Tom has followed up in Dennis Bell's footsteps Um pretty aggressively now that you know everything kind of got tabled with with the fire department and the city emergency planners when COVID happened we were golden rain was planning on an evacuation drill in 2020 but that the the fire department and the city just had to put that all on hold so that has recently been resurrected we've had a series of meetings we've already done a tabletop uh, planning exercise with the fire department the police department the city the county um, all around Ross Warrant, and that's an anticipation of doing an actual live drill in the Ross Moore community sometime this spring. So Tom, the city, the fire department, the police department, they've all been, are interested in this, and we think that this will happen sometime this spring. So Tom is working on that and trying to work out the details. It is not going to include the whole community. It will be likely one zone that they will practice with and use that to model how they would manage a full evacuation of the community. And, and, and one final thing I think to talk about on evacuations is that these wildfires that have occurred in California and the, and the West over these last few years have, have caused a rethinking of how to manage an evacuation. So it used to be stay in your home, stay sheltered, wait until you had an evacuation order. Now, as they when they recognize that conditions might exist that 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 could you know create um, you know a major fire, they are now encouraging people to self evacuate in advance. And what they learned from Paradise was that the self evacuation without an evacuation order is the way to go. You move people out of here sooner. So residents, have, and we've been messaging this now for about at least two years, EPO, uh, Emergency Preparedness Organization of Rossmore, they've been messaging the same thing. So um, getting residents to think about in ahead of time, where would you go if you had to leave um, because you were frightened? Uh, you thought that the conditions were ripe, you know, maybe PG&E has issued a, one of their shutoffs, um, because they've you know, tested the humidity, they tested the wind speed, they tested the, the temperature. They all feel that the conditions are there for um, a, the possibility of a fire. So they shut the power off. So when that happens, that's the cue for residents to start taking note and be thinking about where you're going to go outside of this immediate area. Um, so family and friends that live outside of this, you know, Diablo range area is where you should go. What does that mean? Go to Sacramento or find family or friends, get a hotel room somewhere, but move out of this area until the danger subsides. That way, there will be a lot less people here once a mandatory evacuation got issued. And then the fire department and the police department and Golden Rain Foundation can work in concert to, to move people, uh, get people out of here. I know we've we've covered a lot of ground and I know we could cover a lot more, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So before we do sign off, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about where you think you see us headed for 2022. I mean, we've still got COVID on our plate, but there's also a lot of things going on in Rossmore. So where do you think we're headed? Yeah, I, I would like to say, you know, I, I, I looked at my notes from a year ago and, and I I think in my CEO report, I had said, you know, with the, at that point, a year ago in December of, uh, what is that, 2020, it looked like with the vac vaccines on the horizon that this thing could wind down and thought by the end of 2021, this will all be behind us. And I'm sorry I got that one wrong. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, and it's concerning that, you know, the Omicron right now, as I said at the very outset, 
it's it's spiking. It's it's the highest infection rates that we've seen during th- the entire pandemic by double. So it's uh, I think that that's going to be the narrative here for at least the first few months of of 2022. Um, the board, you know, shut everything down through the end of this month on January 27th. They will meet again to evaluate where we're at and to see whether they should extend that or not. Hopefully we see these things starting to level off in the next few days and and decline significantly and, and, and we can start to open things back up again. I, I have to believe, and again, you look at 20, or I'm sorry, 1918, uh, the pandemic in that year, two and a half years later, it was mostly done and gone. And we'll, we'll, so the, the big question is, will that occur here with this one? Um, I'd like to think that it will, um, but I, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic, but um, that's going to drive our decisions now for the next several months. Uh, but I'd like to think that we are ready and prepared to reopen. But I, I will say that we are still struggling with what is being called the great resignation uh, across the country. And this is where people are quitting their jobs with no job lined up. And it's a phenomenon. I, I watched 60 Minutes last night. Um, they did a, one of their episodes was on the quote unquote great resignation is that people, millions of people nationwide have just quit work that are eligible to work. They, and they're not looking for work. They've just, I, I think, the, the uh, COVID has just caused them to reassess their lives and like, what's important? Do I really need to work? Um, and then on the other hand, you have people who are us- using this as an opportunity to find a different job. Uh, grass is always greener on the other side. So people that are exploring a di- you know, different employment um, and employers are desperate. So they're paying more money. And what is that going to do? That's going to cause inflation. It's going to drive prices up because employers have to raise their prices. The cost of doing business has gone up. So we're going to likely be experiencing, we are experiencing that. We've had, I've never seen in my entire, I've, I've been in the workforce for 40 years. I've never seen um, the level of, of uh, vacant positions for this organization And every organization that you see everywhere, you drive downtown, you see now hiring signs in every window. So if a resident here wants to get a job, go get a job. This is a great time. You can almost name your price. (laughs) Um, Go work in a restaurant, go work for Amazon. I mean, everybody's desperate work. If you're in a healthcare profession, they are desperate for nurses. The nurses are leaving the profession in droves. They are exhausted and burned out. And, and we all are, we're, exa- we're all exhausted and burned out from this, whether you're working or not. Mm-hmm. So um, I think that this is going to continue to be the narrative that we're all going to be living with for a while. Uh, we, do, we have a lot of vacancies here at Rossmore, um, a lot of job openings. So we are more or less ready to reopen things. Although, you know, we don't have lifeguards. We had to close our pools early because we could not f- hire lifeguards. And we we're, we're paying significantly more than than pools outside of Rossmore, and yet not attracting anyone. And and this all comes down to flexibility. This is part of what sixty minutes was talking about last night. Employees now they think are looking for employers who are flexible. Well, Uber. If you're a driver for Uber, you have complete flexibility of of, of your work hours whenever you want to work you put up the sign or you know the electronic sign i'm open for business start accepting rides if you want to be a lifeguard you can't you got to go drive to rossmore you got to go you know sit in the cold you got to manage a pool um so and they pay about the same so which job would you rather have more and more people are choosing the flexibility of being an uber driver than they want to be a lifeguard so those are the those are the challenges and and that i don't I mean, other than continuing to keep increasing the pay rates and providing, we're, we're, act, we're talking about, and we'll be talking about that with the board later this month, whether to offer financial incentives for, to hire people because we're desperate. We've got so many job openings. Now, the good and the bad of that is that we have a lot of job openings, and, which means when things open up, we're not, we, we may not be able to open up like the pools. Um, we're actively recruiting right now for to get ready when the pools are going to open in March. Um, 
and the, and the good side of all of that is that well if we're not if we have all these vacancies we have a huge surplus <laughs> <laughs> and so that's good because the surplus has come back to the residents in the form of, of a you know return of of the surplus at the end of the year so that part i guess is good so residents say well, why am i paying so much money well you're 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 have to keep paying we can't the board and nor the kind of mutuals the mutuals make up most of the coupon grf is a smaller much smaller part of the coupon but they don't have the flexibility to to cut that off or to reduce that you have to wait till whether or not to see whether or not you've accumulated a surplus at the end of the year we uh, know for 2021 we're going to have a very large surplus that's going to come back to the residents in some fashion uh, 2022 we don't you know we're here we're the we're on this is january 10th that we're recording this so we don't know how 2022 is going to play out yet but you know if we continue to have vacancies employment vacancies we're going to it'll be driving another surplus towards the end of the year so we'll, we'll have to wait and see how how the year plays out well, it'll be an interesting one. Um, we know how busy you are, Tim. So absolutely appreciate that you took the time to talk with us today. Thank you. Thanks, Ann. I, I appreciate everybody. Hopefully a few people listen to this and, and, and understand the thinking behind the board's decision to shut things down. Uh, here we were going to talk about all the accomplishments of 2021. <laughs> we never really got to that. Uh, we'll have to save that Our maybe next for talk. another time. Okay. All right. Thanks, Ann. Thanks for everything Thank you're doing you. to keep the community informed. You too. Thank you again for joining us. Please keep safe. <laughs>